All right, this morning, if you would take your Bibles, please turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter, toward the end of the New Testament. And if you take your Bibles and turn to chapter number 1, our text will be taken from 2 Peter chapter number 1. And I'm going to read from verse number 12 down to the end of the chapter. So as we read these words, I pray that you will uh, take them in and that what God has to show us from this uh, part of the word of God today will strengthen us in our faith and our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse number 12, the Bible says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Well, we are a Bible-based, Bible-centered, and Bible-preaching church. Agreed? Amen. Amen. And we believe that the Bible is, in its entirety, the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And as such, we hold the Bible to be without error in its narrative and infallible in its teaching. For us, it's the absolute and final authority in all matters of faith and practice. When Paul wrote to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 15, he said, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now when you think about that in its immediate context, the scriptures to which Paul was referring in Timothy's childhood would have been the Old Testament. In Timothy's childhood, his mother and his grandmother sat him on either of their knees and taught him the word of God. And at that point in history, they didn't have a New Testament. They had the Old Testament. And yet, Paul goes on to say, with those scriptures, meaning the Old Testament, and the Bible that Timothy grew up with, he said all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration means that it is God-breathed. In other words, God breathed life into the holy writings. And uh, the word of God is quick. It is alive. It is a living book. And uh, that is a supernatural miracle from God. And the scriptures that Timothy grew up with and heard as a child that would bring him to the place of understanding the gospel and receiving Christ, those scriptures, the Bible says, were given by inspiration of God. What is interesting about that is that Timothy's mother, Timothy's grandmother, did not have the original writings. The books of Moses had been written 1,500 years or more before Timothy, and over that course of time, the books of Moses would have been copied into the scrolls and the sacred uh, writings of the 
Jews in the, ta- in the synagogues and the tabernacle and so forth, the temple. But uh, all of the original writings from the prophets, from the Psalms, from David, from Solomon, all of the different writers in the Old Testament, their writings, their original writings that were written down had been lost, had been destroyed because the Jews had a practice of copying the scriptures and then ceremonially and sacredly destroying the old copies lest they fall into profane hands. And so when Timothy had the scriptures, he had copies of copies of copies of the old, uh, the old Testament, and yet Paul says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's the miracle of preservation that we read about in the word of God. And that's the Old Testament. That's what Timothy had as a child before the New Testament was written down. But the question I want us to focus on today and the question I want to ask is, what about the New Testament? How did we get the New Testament? We know a lot about the old, the the human writers that God used and holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, the miracle of inspiration and so forth. But how did we receive the New Testament? And that's important because uh, we are a New Testament church. Now, that doesn't mean we reject the Old Testament. We believe all the Bible is the Word of God, including the Old Testament. But as a church, we don't operate under the Old Covenant. We operate under the New Testament. That's why we sometimes refer to ourselves as a New Testament church, for our faith and our order. Well, I want to talk about the New Testament today specifically. And this morning, I want to preach on the subject of how we receive the New Testament. We have it here. I hope you've got a copy in your hands with your Bible. You're open to a New Testament book. And for most of us, we take it for granted that, well, that's my Bible. But have you ever wondered how we got that Bible, how we got the New Testament? And this evening... Lord willing, I want to go on with the same focus of the New Testament and look at the question of can we trust the New Testament? We have it, we read it, we preach from it, but can we trust the New Testament? So come back this evening, we'll talk about the credibility of the New Testament and I think you'll be amazed that we can trust it, of course, and why we can trust it. It's important that we do understand why we believe what we believe and, and uh, so this is the purpose of these messages today. The Apostle Peter writes about the New Testament in verse number 12. He, he talks about the present truth. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. These things refer to what he's already said in chapter number 1 and that you are, though you know them and be established in the present truth. So how did we get the New Testament? Well, when you consider that question, it's really the answer is the same as how did we get the Old Testament because in order for you and me to have the very word of God in written form that we can read for ourselves, we can hear preached, and we can trust, in order for us to have that from God, there are four basic steps, four essential steps. The first step is revelation. Before we can have truth, it must be revealed. Secondly is inspiration, meaning that that truth needs to be recorded. Thirdly is preservation, that the truth must be retained. And the fourth step for us as English-speaking people is translation, that truth must be rendered into the language that we speak. I know some of you speak other languages, probably a little better than English, uh, but the same principles and practice here applies. So when we ask the question today, how did we get the New Testament? I'll go through each of these steps and explain them, what it means, and these are the steps that lead to the fact that we have the New Testament today. First of all, truth must be revealed. I mean, you and I would not even know there is a God except 
that God has revealed himself to man. And we understand that God created man for fellowship. And it was God who uh, spoke first to man, who revealed himself to man. The first words of God to a human being are found in the book of Genesis where the Bible says the Lord God commanded the man. So God initiated the revelation of himself to mankind. God spoke. And so the Old Testament is God's revelation of himself and of truth through the prophets. But what about the New Testament? Is that the same? Well, first of all, consider what Peter uh, says. He was the writer in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, here in verse number 1. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Saviour Jesus Christ. In chapter 3 and verse number 1, Paul, uh, uh, Peter refers to this as his second epistle. He says, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So Peter makes it very, very clear here that he is the writer of the epistle that we call Second Peter. There's no question about that. And uh, yet how did he write it? Well, he tells us he didn't make this up. In verse number 16, he said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. He says, what I'm writing here is not a fairy st a story, it's not a fairy tale, it's not some fantasy that I've had uh, that I just decided to write down. And he said there was no collusion in doing this, that uh, uh, we didn't get our heads together as a bunch of writers and, and then begin to write the New Testament and, and saying to one another, well, what are you going to say and make sure we say the same thing? He said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. But he does say that for much of what is written in the New Testament, he was an eyewitness. He speaks about that in that same verse. He says at the latter part of verse 16, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In other words, Peter is writing things that he had seen for himself. And we know from the gospel accounts that Peter was one of the first that Jesus called to be one of his followers or disciples. And Peter was with Christ and he was really in a sense the leader of the, of the twelve. And he knew Jesus. Uh, for all of his faults, he was a beloved follower of Jesus Christ. He says, what I've written down, I know what I'm talking about. This is not something that is made up. But we know that Peter didn't see everything. And Peter had not full knowledge of future events and so forth. So if Peter wrote what he saw, how come we've got more in the New Testament? Well, Peter didn't have to see everything or even remember everything because God intervened in giving this revelation of himself. Look at John chapter 14 and verse number 26. Jesus here is on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's speaking to his disciples and he gives them a tremendous promise. He's promising the uh, the comforter who would come when Jesus would send the comforter, the Holy Ghost. But in John 14, 26, the Bible says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, notice this, he shall teach you all things. So there you have the promise that all things in the New Testament were coming and taught from the Holy Ghost. Sure, these men had a memory. These men had seen things. They were eyewitnesses to much of what Jesus did. But we find that uh, God revealed it through the Holy Spirit. He shall teach you all things, and notice this, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I've said unto you. And then if you flip over to John 16 and verse number 13, Jesus continues that promise. He says, how be it 
when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now Jesus gave that to the apostles, and we know the last book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation, is all about things to come. And, and Jesus said, now, you don't have to make this up, John. You don't have to make it up, Peter or, or Luke or whoever uh, was there. He said, the Holy Ghost is going to show you these things and he's going to lead you into all truth. There's a promise that God would reveal truth exactly as it is to the writers of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul himself spoke of receiving divine revelation in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 3 talking about what he wrote he said how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery Paul didn't know these things but God through the Holy Spirit revealed these truths to him he wrote in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. So God reveals truth. If God doesn't reveal truth, we don't have truth. But God who is gracious and who loves us and wants to communicate with us, he has initiated and revealed this truth. You know, Paul wrote 13 books, almost half the content of the New Testament. In 2 Peter, if you're still there or if you could go back there, I want you to see what Peter had to say about Paul's letters. Very revealing. Um, In chapter number 3, 2 Peter chapter number 3, look at verse 15 and 16. Peter says, "...an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him." All right, this wisdom, where did it come from? came from the Holy Ghost, who revealed all things. And the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you, also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do, also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So even in Peter's day, and Peter wrote Second Peter around 67 AD, he knew about Paul's epistles and he calls them the scriptures. He didn't say, well, this is what Paul jibber-jabbered on about. He said, God gave him the same wisdom, the same revelation of truth. And so in Paul's letters, half the New Testament, we have God's truth. And Peter writes, I'm an eyewitness and God has revealed truth to me. Clearly, the writers of the New Testament claimed divine revelation of truth. Uh, Luke, in the preface to his gospel, he said, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things now that's quite a claim don't you think I don't think any of us would say well I have perfect understanding of my job or everything we're always learning but Luke is not boasting here he's just saying because of the divine revelation that came through the spirit of God what I write is perfect perfect understanding of all things and he says from the very first Some people point out the phrase from the very first in the Greek means from above, which is true. He received that revelation from above and he said to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of these things wherein thou hast been instructed. Because God has revealed truth, we we can be certain. And that's the first step in how we got the New Testament. God had to reveal that truth to man. And it has been divinely revealed. But that raises another question. What what value is that to you and me? 
um, the apostles lived 2,000 years ago. And if God revealed truth to them, he didn't, <laughs> I wasn't there. How, what, what, is the perp, what is the point of that? Well, step number two, truth has to be recorded. It has to be written down so that other generations, including us today, can have that truth. And that's the second step, revelation of truth from God to man and then writing it down. You know, I'm at the age and stage, or at least approaching that, where if my wife says something to me, I, I tend to forget what she said. Sometimes I don't even remember that she said it. She says she did, and that settles it. But you know, a lot of us, we know <laughs> that uh, we have to write things down. Uh, we, have to, we have to have a note, or someone needs to write it out for us. Um, just uh, a week or so ago, we had my wife's brother with us uh, from Australia, and uh, we go back a long way. He's, on earth, he's my best mate. He's my best friend, and, and uh, uh, most of the time that we uh, were together, uh, either going through old photographs uh, uh, and uh, documents or just talking about old times, reminiscing, uh, there were a lot of things that I forgot. I'd forgotten about, uh, and uh, we, uh, he, he would say something, and I'd say, well, I don't exactly remember that, but sounds like it. And, you know, we, we have fading memories. Uh, that's something that we, we have to deal with to some degree. And, and so what God said and revealed to his holy prophets and apostles 2,000 years ago, the only way I could know what he said is if it was written down. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 15, this was the intent, moreover I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease. Peter says, when I'm dead and gone, that you will have these things always in remembrance. That's why he says in chapter 3, this second epistle, I write. Because Peter's dead and gone. He's with the Lord. But the words that God gave him have been written down. And that's the process that we know theologically as inspiration. Inspiration means the, re the writing or the recording of God's revelation in such a way that the words that were written down was God's truth exactly as he gave it and as he wanted it. It wasn't just man writing down his ideas of what God said. You know, children do that. They, they'll say to their parents, the parent will say, didn't I tell you this? Well, I thought you meant this. <laughs> no, the, the, the process, the miracle of inspiration ensures that what these men wrote they only wrote it as they were moved by the Holy Ghost in verse 21. They were supernaturally moved to record the very words of God. Paul describes the step in Ephesians chapter 3. In verse number 3 he says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four in few words. So we see the steps, revelation of God's truth, then the recording writing it down and again uh, if we if it wasn't written down uh, we would never know that it was said and so we have that truth recorded for us praise the Lord for that but then again here's the next problem if these words were written down on paper or parchment 2,000 years ago how does that help me today because I don't have the original writings that Paul had. I don't think there's a museum in the world that has any, the original copy. You know, we have uh, several copies of the Constitution of the United States that are written. You can go see them. That's only 300 years ago uh, or whatever. But uh, we don't have those what we call autographs, the writings of of the apostles, they are lost in time. So it was good that they wrote down the revelation, but 
how does, how does that work for us? Well, that's the third step. Truth must be retained. In other words, what was written has to be preserved to the present day. And as we saw there in verse 15, that was Peter's intent. In verse 13, he said, Yea, I think it meet, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. He's talking about his death. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me, moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. The preservation of scripture is an important part of the process. If that was not present, then we would not have a New Testament. But because it was revealed from God and because it was written down without error by men and because their writings were preserved, we have the New Testament available to us today. That was Paul's intent also in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 4. He said, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four in few words, then he said, whereby when ye read. And he was, you know, he was writing to the Ephesians at the time. He was in a prison in Rome and uh, he couldn't get out. From Rome to Ephesus is 1,250 miles. So there had to be some preservation of what Paul wrote in those prison epistles. Peter wrote his second epistle five years after Paul wrote Ephesians, but he's referring back to Paul's letters. So you can see that the word of God was written down and it was being kept. And the fact is that all 27 books of the New Testament have been retained or preserved for us under this day. We don't have the originals, but these books in the Bible, in the New Testament, were copied out by hand, just like the Old Testament with Timothy, he had copies of the Old Testament, copies of copies of copies. So during the time before printing was invented, people wrote out by hand, that's what the word manuscript is, a handwriting, and they would write out the New Testament. The New Testament books were written on paper, according to 2 John verse 12, or on parchment, and paper and parchment deteriorate over time. Um, you may have some old books, <laughs> and uh, you've got to be very, very careful with old books because they're very fragile. Paper uh, just deteriorates, and if it's not looked after, it doesn't last very long. And uh, especially when you're talking about the Word of God, people had their hands on it, they read it, Every day they were checking and reading the scriptures and that in and of itself would wear out the copies. So before those copies were worn out, people would copy out the word of God again. And so it's been handed down to us by that process. Well, how do we know that we have a reliable record today? How do we know that um, when they made those copies, they didn't make mistakes? Um, well, because God promised that he would preserve his word. And not only preserve his word as a book, but preserve the very words that he gave. How do we know that from the New Testament? We could go to the Old Testament, give a lot of promises there, but uh, in the New Testament, Jesus said in John 12, 48, listen to this, He that rejecteth me and rejecteth my words hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same, the same shall judge him in the last day, on the day of judgment. That means that the word of God has got to last at least until judgment day. I believe it will last throughout eternity because it's eternal. Look back into 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. The Bible here is talking about salvation and how we're saved. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So the, the word of God is going to be around long after you and I have departed from this earth. For all flesh is as grass, 
And all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. So we're going we're gonna to go the way of all the earth, the Bible says. But, verse 25, the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Now the gospel is New Testament. And so therefore the New Testament is going to be around forever. I guess when we're in heaven and time is gone and we're in the eternal state, we can still go and read God's word. It'll be there. Of course, Jesus is the living word of God. So the Bible promises that God would preserve his word. And it makes sense, don't you think? <laughs> Why would God go to all the trouble of giving us his inerrant, infallible word, having it written down, only to lose it or allow it to be corrupted through the centuries. That's not the God that I know. He's the God who's able to finish what he started. And just doesn't make sense that he would give us a perfect word and then over 2,000 years of handwriting and then printing, um, the word of God got changed. And what we have really is an approximation. By the way, God didn't say to Timothy or the, uh, Paul didn't write to Timothy, that from a child thou hast known the holy approximations. Because he had copies of copies. He said, thou hast known the holy scriptures. If it wasn't for God, yes, the Bible would be corrupted, we never know. I mean, you take some of the other classical books of history, of which there are, is very little evidence for them, but uh, what was written by, shall we say, Homer, uh, what we could find today would not be exactly what Homer wrote, but it's because of the copying process. It doesn't work that way with God's word because we're dealing with a supernatural book. So those three steps give us the New Testament today. Truth is revealed from heaven. Without that, we have no Bible. Truth is then recorded and supernaturally recorded so as to be written down without error. And yet God could use... The, uh, the style and, of writing of the different human writers. It really is a, a wonderful miracle how inspiration gives us the pure word of God. And yet even that's not sufficient because writing it down 2,000 years ago, uh, we have to have it today. And so the third step is the, uh, the retaining or the, the preservation of God's word. Well, there's one last step I want to just mention briefly here you see it's clear that Peter intended his epistles to be read by everybody uh, if you go back to first Peter and we know Peter wrote this because he said in second Peter this is the second epistle but notice in uh, chapter 1 of verse 1 of first Peter we read Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus Galatia Cappadocia Asia and Bithynia. Well, those are all provinces and I'm, I'm sure that they spoke Greek, which was the common language of the day. Uh, I'm sure they probably spoke a little Latin because they were Roman prov provinces. But also those provinces had their own dialects. We know that from Acts chapter 13 where Paul and, and Barnabas came to one of those areas, uh, Lake, Lake Ionia, and uh, there was the speech of Lycaonia. Well, Lycaonians need the word of God. <laughs> Spanish people need the word of God. Eskimos need the word of God. So uh, we need to have one more step, and that is the rendering or the translation of God's word into the language of the reader. Paul intended that would happen in Ephesians 3, 4. He said whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. I don't think anyone here, if I'm, I'm, I may be corrected, but I don't think anyone here knows Greek. Uh, the best we know is to look up Strong's Concordance and find a Greek word and sometimes throw it out to sound intellectual and impress you, but we don't know Greek grammar, Greek syntax, we're not readers of Greek. We're not Greek speaking. 
The only, only Greek I know is a fish and chip shop owner uh, down by the corner. <laughs> and uh, that doesn't help. We're not Greek. And God doesn't want us to learn Greek so we can understand the Bible. So we have a translation. We have a translation into English, and that is God's intent. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 14, as he was giving a prophetic overview of the present age in which we find ourselves, Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Well, that's a tall order, but that's our marching orders. That's the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And if we go there and just, I mean, we can do it in many countries, thankfully, but if we go to some of these countries and start preaching the gospel in English, they're just going to look at us funny and say, what are you babbling about? And God knows that, and if, if he commands us to preach the gospel to every creature, then there's going to be that translation of the word of God into a language and yet preserving, preserving the exact words and sense of God. That's an amazing thing. That which was written in common Greek in the first century has been preserved in our English language today so that we can say with all confidence that we have the New Testament. We don't have a holy approximation to what God gave to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and, uh, and uh, uh, Peter and Jude and James. Um, all of these writers, uh, we're not just reading what kind of what they said, we're reading in our own language what God has given to us. And let me be clear, for good reasons, and we'll perhaps mention some of this this evening, I'm talking about the authorised version, the King James Version of 1611. And that's another story. So how did we get the New Testament? My, my desire today in this message is just to educate us or remind us, how did we get this New Testament that we have open before us in our hands today? Well... It didn't just fall out of the sky. There were steps, and every one of them was a miracle. First of all, the miracle that God would reveal truth to man. He didn't have to do that, but he loves us. He loves you, he loves me, and he wants to have a personal relationship with each of us. And the way we relate to one another more than anything else is we communicate. We talk to one another. And the more we talk to one another and converse the more we know about one another and that relationship grows. That's the purpose of God's word. God is speaking to us through his word and he reveals truth. And that truth is written down for generations to come and in the process of writing, it wasn't a writer sitting there scratching his head and saying, now what did Jesus say on that day? I can't quite remember it, but I'll make this up and it'll sound good. No. The Holy Ghost led them into all truth. That is a wonderful miracle and uh, that is the, the step of inspiration. But even having a wonderful Bible in the first century, we have to have it in the 21st century. And so God superintended the transmission of the text down through the ages. We call that preservation. God has preserved his word and then... God intends for his word to be translated so that peoples all around the world will have the pure word of God in their own language. By the way, that's an unfinished task. There are some languages that maybe have a Bible, but it's very corrupted, but that's all they have, and it makes it very, very difficult. But, beloved, we have, or you have, holding in your hands the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the New Testament is so important. Not to minimize the Old Testament, which is the word of God, but the New Testament is the basis for our salvation. Matthew 26, verse 28, as Jesus 
was there with his church in the upper room and he took the cup, the fruit of the vine, and he said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The remission of sins, that, that's the New Testament salvation, not the covering up of sins as they did with the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, but now in the New Testament through Jesus Christ, our sins are remitted. Hebrews 10.17 says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. If you're saved, your sins are forgotten by God. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31, we have the new covenant. And the word covenant means a testament. And Jeremiah prophesied of this in verse 31 of Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant, a new testament with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in that day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That's the Old Testament. Which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But with this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That was a prophecy made by Jeremiah hundreds of years before Jesus Christ came. And when Jesus came, we have the new covenant, the New Testament, not only available to the houses of Israel, but made available to the Gentiles today. So the New Testament's important. It's, it's vital for our salvation. It's the basis of our faith, what we believe. As Christians, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. You say, what do you believe as a Christian? You hold the New Testament up and you say, this is what I believe. And it tells you our faith. That is what we are. And not only that, it's the basis of our church for in Ephesians chapter 2 using the metaphor of a temple the Bible says that a church Bible Baptist church for example and other New Testament churches are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the spirit the foundation of Bible Baptist Church are the apostles and prophets. And where do we find the apostles and prophets today? In the words of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ that have been preserved for us and translated for us so that we can read them in our own language in the New Testament. The message of the New Testament is a message of love. The love of God through Jesus Christ. And so the New Testament is a testament or a covenant of hope, the hope of eternal life. And beloved, understand it is a supernatural testament with a supernatural message that will supernaturally change your life, both this life and the life to come. One last scripture back in 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse number two, Peter writes, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of
of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You know, God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. When we look at that, I think of he's given us everything we need in the New Testament pertaining to eternal life. You can be saved through the message of the New Testament, which is that Jesus came and died for our sins, was buried and rose again, according to the scriptures. That's the good news. And it gives us eternal life. But also, we have everything we need for godliness. To live our life as God wants us to live our lives as Christians here on this earth. Everything is there for us in the New Testament. You don't have to go outside of the New Testament to find out what God wants. Even though, as John said, all the things that Jesus said and did, if we wrote them in a book, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it. But everything we need to know, we have in the New Testament. And today I've tried to extol that portion of the Word of God we call the New Testament and to teach us how did we get this amazing book, this life-changing book. Well, give God the glory. He used human beings, but God saw to it that his Word is perfectly preserved for us even for this day. The question is, have you personally received its message have you believed what God has said was there a time in your life when you came and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ I'll tell you it's not faith in man it's faith in what he says and the word of God is sure